Uh, um, yeah. Well, this is weird. We've uh, talked for 40 minutes and I still haven't brought up anything about Sloan or anything. Well, else. I'll be on again another time when we can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for creating this, um, you and your bandmates creating both two things. A, a really giant discography to go through, a huge body of work where it seems like almost everything I'm coming across, I like, you know, out of 12 albums. And you're also providing this bizarre situation that not very many people can claim, which is you somehow have been able to be in the same band for like a close to, is it 30 years now? Yeah, 30 years in uh, February 90, uh, 90, so 91, yeah, beginning of 91. And I was so, in a band, I was in a band with one of the guys since 87, but yeah, the same four guys. Jay, and it's, was it Jay? Jay, yeah, Jay and I have been in the band since 87. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's hard, of course. But still, but, uh, and as hard as that, as, as hard as it is, and I'm sure it is, to actually be able to claim that even though there's tough, there's tough times in that situation, to still be doing it, that's extremely rare. So you obviously must know, damn man, you know, this, it's not always a picnic, but not not a lot of people can claim both of those things. Yes. No, I'm, I'm extremely proud. And, uh, you know, I think that we have an undeniable body of work, you know, you might not love it or whatever, but it's not only, you know, there's quantity. So there's that, which is, I guess, somewhat impressive. I think a lot of it's good, but that's not for me to say, but, but it's also created by, uh, four people that are encouraged to, uh, contribute as equally as possible. Like, uh, you know, we don't often sit down and write songs together. Um, and we never really did, but sometimes we do, but uh, we we almost be behave almost just like, you know, white album style, like, um, you know, the backing band and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. uh, but you know, I, I can't speak for everybody in the band, but from where I'm sitting, I'm able to enjoy the music that everybody brings in like i like patrick is into the kind of harder rock stuff and andrew's kind of into dylan which isn't really my thing but like andrew's also capable of making um whatever masterpiece music and jay just keeps getting better and better like i just i just uh i'm really it was kind of my band in the first place i was the person who knew all the people so mm -hmm. i was the central central character so it was my band to share in a way. It's like, I was like, let's share equally everything and invest in everybody as a, you know, as an investment in keeping everybody interested in the band and all that kind of stuff. And I just think that, uh, sure. you know, it's been maybe hard to market in some ways, but the fact that we've lasted this long, I think that it's, it's really cool to look back on the fact that it was, it was kind of made Frankenstein style Compilation stuff. Every record is kind of like a compilation, yeah. of, uh, which is, I think, whatever. It's, I think it's the most interesting thing you can do. But uh, anyway, I'm proud of it, and thanks for uh, for saying so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think actually what you said uh, earlier about being hard to market. That's kind of funny you said that because somebody that I had talked to on one of these things chimed in on social media and said it's probably kind of hard to market because everybody, everybody writes and there's three singers or four singers. And it's mm -hmm. like, I, I guess that is true, but it almost seems like a band like Sloan was, I mean, obviously I'm, I reacted the same way I react when I discovered how much I liked what you guys are about the same way I react when I discover anything that, I don't know, uh, and I just stumble into, which is like, you know, like, how could I have not known about this? But, you know, there's no way you can know about every little thing, you know, but it was, that's always how I react. I'm like, how could I have not known about how great this is? This, you know, it's almost like it was tailor-made for me to discover 30 years after the, the fact or whatever. But that's that's how I react with uh, everything that, that, you know, because yeah, I think, I think like you, I've spent maybe too much time listening to music in my life, but that's what I'm really into, you know, a lot. So it's like, 
when you discover something like that, it's a big deal because it, you know, it doesn't really happen a lot. Because you, you said yourself that you're more into discovering comedy than um yeah I'm, I'm less likely to to get into like a, a band with 200 songs in their career like i feel like the last the last major thing that i turned on to was probably in my 30s and that was probably the kinks and like i didn't know them as a kid like i only knew you really got me in those kinds of things lola and, what's that the song lola because that was a big FM radio turntable hit. Yeah, stage. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I knew Lola, and, and it's it's great too. But uh, but yeah, I didn't know I didn't know the the Lola versus Power Man record and all that kind of stuff. And and you know, people had pushed, and and I know you probably have experienced this too, like people who push things on you, whether it's big star or something you don't know, and it's just like, oh, I don't want to hear that. You know, this trendy thing that everybody's talking about. I don't want to. I don't want to hear about this big star or whatever. This miss this mistrust of hype. Yeah. So I know, I don't know if we were ever that hype. Now here's a question to you. So someone who's just only whatever say admitted to or whatever saying, giving us a chance. Do you think that you've heard our name that you've known who we are for 20 years yes. and you've associated us with what? Like you, like, I don't know that you would spend a lot of time. I, I but haven't would you associated be like, you guys with anything. Cause right. I, I, okay. I don't think I, I knew you were a Canadian. I, right. I knew you were a Canadian. Um, no, actually, that's not true. What I would probably have associated Sloan with would be some indie rock, some idea of indie rock that I probably would not be super excited about, I right. guess, maybe. Yeah. But I, but having said that, I, I can't even explain what, you know, what does that even mean? I have no idea what that means. Yeah. But no, I, I, I have, I have heard the name for a long time. I think it was Steven, really. He was like, he was like, he wore a Sloan shirt every other day on tour. Mm -hmm. Said that you guys were his favorite band for like 20 years now or something like that. So that should have been the the, the kickoff. Well, I think and, that he, we, we played with them and I, so I've known him since 97 or whatever. <laughs> and um, he was, he, we, Sloan made a double album in 2006. Yeah, and, and he was just really, uh, he was just really impressed that we could do that at that stage. You know, it was our eighth album, and he was like, "Fucking hell," you know. I, I think we had already kind of thought of ourselves as kindred spirits, and definitely told him that we loved Red Cross so much. But he was oh, yeah. just like, "It's like, wow, you guys did that on your eighth record. That's really inspiring, and whatever. I'm inspired to make more records with Red Cross, and like whatever. I, it was touching for him to say." Yeah. So. Yeah, he's been a he's been a good supporter. So, yeah, yeah, is he is he is he represented in that Happy in Bali cartoon? He is. <laughs> well, the the reason why I was attracted to Red Cross as a young kid, is getting into punk rock, is because I knew I was never going to look convincing like a punk rocker. Right. You know, I, I was like this kind of pudgy Jewish kid. And you know, I, I'm I'm just not gonna look cool with an eight foot mohawk or trying to look like uh, Sid Vicious or whatever. And and that didn't really appeal to me. But what appealed to me was the fact that they were just like long haired, like you know, they didn't have any costumes. Or 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 uh, probably another reason I like Black Flag a lot was because they were for the most part just normal looking geeky kind of guys except for i guess henry rollins who yeah. obviously you know pretty but like you know des Cadena, he's like the first guy that uh was apparently into punk rock that grew his hair out and for whatever reason that really appealed to me because it just was like okay there's they don't look like i don't have to look like anything i can just look like how i look like so that i, I always felt that black flag were um uh, just the contrarians are just like making fun of of the the hom homogenization of the punk scene and all that kind of stuff they're just like like look you think at you black fucking, flag were making fun you think like when black of, flag of, of the punk scene like they were already kind of over it and then people are just like yeah we have to conform to this thing and here's the dress code and black flag were like just making yeah. fun of all those kids I, I think so and then when they started growing their hair i mean like it sounds stupid now, but you know, if you're, I think people didn't really know that 
you could just do whatever you wanted to and that there was no real there was no yeah. real rule book for anything so people would just invent these things out of just what they imagined it must have been like and they were some of the first people that stopped cutting their hair and just said well, went, you know we like rock you know we didn't throw out our rock records you know when we like i never got rid of any of my rock and roll music records when i got into punk rock it was just like okay it's more it was certainly more exciting mm -hmm. in some some way than uh the idea of going to see led zeppelin that the los angeles forum and you're they're like these little dots on stage and whatever that still would have been awesome i never I never had that experience. Yeah. But but um, you know, I, I never got rid of all my uh regular rock records because I heard seven seconds and right. Not not a lot of people can say that. There were a lot of instant punk rockers that suddenly or even stranger people that never liked music until they heard punk rock, which I find really bizarre, you know. I wasn't like some I wasn't like an art school kid that liked the clash, you know. I was I liked Kiss and Beatles and and Cheap Trick and but then punk rock came around and that seemed to be kind of pretty exciting you know and that that's pretty much it I, I never I wasn't like an instant anything I guess have we have we already done, talked about the Sex Pistols versus the Clash have we already done this no but I'm gonna give it to the Sex Pistols if that's the, uh, a debate you haven't gotten into the Sex Pistols. No, no, I love the Sex Pistols and the Clash. I don't. I'm not really a big. I, I'm probably the only person I know that just never liked the Clash. I'm out. I like. I like. I like a few. No, of no. Songs. Yeah, yeah. I like so, a few so, of their songs. But, but this, this is like, the same. I have the same. I have the same take. Really? I'm like. I'm like I the like, pit. I like everything else that came out of like uh, the Stranglers or uh, X-ray Specs or PIL like wire like almost every other uk either punk the dam of course the dam almost every other uk punk rock or pre-punk rock or post-punk band i like and the clash are the only band i don't really like to this very fucking day and people just lose their fucking minds when you right. when you say that and that's like why are people have such big hard-ons for the clash obviously they're nice people and everything and there's a few songs I like, but man, people just lose their goddamn minds when you say you don't like the Clash. What's your theory behind that? Well, I just I, I have the same I have the same sort of take. I just I even though I don't dislike the Clash, I don't when it, dislike when it, when it comes to arguing. I always say that I don't like the Clash. I always say that Pistols, yes, the Clash, are are basically like G. E. Smith and the Saturday Night Live band. I'm like I already like I when I first got. With, with, that's great. That's I was great. just like, um, yeah, I was just like, is this supposed to be punk? Because it sounds like Saturday Night Live. Um, <laughs> so I, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't hear the clash. I don't hear the clash until, um, what's the last one or the last good one? Uh, um, uh, uh, straight, straight, straight to hell. Yeah. Oh, Combat Rock's coming out. But I'm also at the same time hearing hardcore, and I'm just like it just sounds so not hard, you know what I mean? Or even though I, I I love I love combat rock now, and even the whatever. But my other thing about the Clash is I always think that like when you see a picture of the Sex Pistols, it's like they're like, Rrr. but you see a picture of the Clash, like they're just like like they're just like male models, like just like ready to go. It's so, like ah, these guys are kind of like seem like wankers, but whatever. <laughs> but but you whatever. Realize, you realize how unpopular that viewpoint is to have. I know, I know. I get like, assassinated for, for whatever reason. The only other thing that I've come across when people have opinions about, and they're all just opinions. It's not like anybody taste is subjective. But for some reason, not liking the Clash or not thinking they're the greatest band and the, the last, the greatest band ever, is like a serious affront to a lot of people and i never can figure out why out of all the bands in the world are people so i think it's because they say they say something like how yeah. the mc5 say something yeah. all that saying something stuff that people yeah. will hold you to but um i think the only other thing or only other opinion that i've been raked over the calls about 
after the clash is me saying that I preferred the Velvet Underground after John Cale left and they left the Andy Warhol thing a yeah. million times over. I think the Doug Buell on bass period is so much better to me. Even the yes. long on out, like live 1969, when they take a song and make it 14 minutes long, I think that's infinitely more exciting to me than the, the Warhol thing or Nico or as great as John Cale is. And people also cannot believe that, which I think is really funny as well. Yeah. So well, well, I, I completely agree with you there too. Like I watched that Velvet Underground documentary. I'm just like, would you just get to the fucking Velvet Underground self-titled and, and loaded, please, and get stop talking about this fucking bullshit? But anyway, they won't, of course, they won't give him, they won't give him his due. I don't know. They 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 look at him like some interloper that that destroyed the band and like uh I think that I mean, you know, again, taste is subjective, but it's like yeah, I agree. I, I was waiting for just even a kernel of anything that was pro uh, they, they needed they, they 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 you mean on that documentary? They they needed that, they needed anything. kale. They needed kale. They couldn't do it. Well, kale's alive and they you know, you know what I mean. But yeah, I know um, but yeah, so yeah, a uh, couple sacred cows there. But uh, I was going to say, um, my mind was open a couple times. It was a band in Halifax called Dog Food, and they were like, kind of like Stooges, kind of punk. You know, they weren't that hardcore. They were just, they were just menacing and scared. they were probably, they were probably into Flipper and stuff like that stuff. I didn't really understand. Or like, but um, yeah, but like, but what the guitar player wore deck shoes, and I was like to my friend, I was like, he's wearing deck shoes. Is that? Does that mean that we can do whatever we want? It's so, such fucking stupid. And then, <laughs> then I drove. I drove to uh, drove to Montreal to see the Descendants in '86. That's like a fourteen-hour drive. Yeah. And while we were there, I saw No Means No, another show that just like my mind exploded. I saw No Means No in '86. That, that the, was that was the same time I saw them in '86. The they came and played the East Coast of the states and. They blew my mind. Actually, no, it was next year because Sex Mad was the record they poured on. So no, this was, was uh, this was you kill me. Okay, so that's right before Sex Mad. But they were they were three piece and the and the yep. and, yeah. but um and then when I was up there, I saw those shows. But there was an also there was a French a French really punk, really <laughs> crazy dogmatically punk, like kind of Liberty Spikes punk band uh, called Capitalist Alienation. Almost sounds like a joke. <laughs> But we went to see that show and my friend was wearing deck shoes, you know, because wow. we had seen dog dog food do it in Halifax. But this was a fucking not like no, no irony, like serious French punk anarcho, like whatever. We were terrified we were, we were going to get killed at this show. Sure. Uh, we did. We did not. But the other and the other thing musically, like I was really into Dag Nasty and like I was really I was in DC. It was like Minor Threat and then so like You made a pilgrimage to, to Discord House. I, I yeah. Like yeah, I made a couple pilgrimages to, to Discord House and E Makai was like super cool to us and like, hey, do you want to stay here? And we we're like, no man, it's cool. We're just gonna sleep in like we're just gonna sleep in a park for three weeks. It, you know, in a place where there are more deaths than the Gaza Strip, like we had no idea. We're just like, but it was exciting, right? It's like that's also when you're doing those kind of things, and it doesn't matter how terrifying the reality really is. It's still super exciting, so you just kind of forget about. And, what... and we didn't know we were harmless. Like we were, we weren't doing drugs. Like we were, we weren't trying to. We weren't in trouble where we we're like, well, we have to find drugs in the states. What are we going to do? Like we were just like eating ice cream sandwiches and buying records like we're just goofy and um, right, right so but, it's the first nasty record right I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that's the record you like first first Dag nasty record was was out when we saw yeah. Dag nasty opened for the descendants in 86 i saw that and yeah. then that was the descendants enjoy tour and the, sh the show was cut short because bill stevenson barfed all over his drums and i, I felt bad i still have the set list i don't have it here but uh whatever it was like this long and they only played two-thirds of it right but uh but anyway sorry and the second time i went to dc we saw fugazi 
And so we went, we loved Dagnasty. There was a band called King Face. Do you ever hear that band? They were yeah, they, like, had that, they, had, they, they had the metal sort of guitar sound. They, they were kind of like, kind of like Van Halen meets hardcore kind of thing. Yeah, Van, with, uh, inter- with, with very interesting vocals. Yeah, they were, I think the, the King Face 12 inch was kind of a big deal to some people. I, yeah. I, uh, we, right. my, my friends loved it and also soul side i think there are brothers i think there's a the sullivan brothers or something or like maybe one was in soul side and one was in king face or something yeah it was mark sullivan i actually see this is my soul <coughs> and Bo- rock, bobby oh, sullivan maybe mark Su- sullivan this, this this is my memory of unimportant stuff taken over where i could remember that stuff but i can't remember my parents birthdays that kind of right. stuff <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah dc was dc was huge they were like uh you know, I moved out here in 86. I, I never finished that story. And I'll try to remember that when I stop interrupting what you're about to tell me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was a really big fan of corrosion and conformity. Right. From back then. Uh, their, anim- uh, you know, uh, their blending of punk rock and heavy metal. Uh, um, actually using Black Sabbath. And Black Flag is sort of a template and melding it together. Nobody really did that a lot back then. And I was really impressed by them and all their friends and all their friends' bands in this area. And they seem like a little more open-minded and a little less dogmatic than some other places. Yeah. Like, it was so small that if people were, you know, interested, it was like, well, you know, come on in, that kind of thing. Yes. So, But D.C. is like five hours south. Wait, wait. Raleigh is five hours south of D.C. and then Richmond's right in between. And uh, D.C. always loomed large down here because they were next to Atlanta. They were like the next big like punk mecca, but there were so many great bands that came from D.C. You know, that, you know, Marginal Man. We, I loved Marginal Man. Grey Matter, I thought they were really good. Yeah, I, I was going to... Void, Scream, yeah. the first Scream album, Faith, <laughs> Minor Threat. We loved everybody loved all that stuff because it was good. And then Rights of Spring, Revolution Summer. I liked Rights of Spring a lot. Was kind of weirded out about the whole idea of people crying. Right. With the whole music. I thought that was kind of weird, but maybe, yeah, yeah. Whatever. And then well, I I went crazy for Rights of Spring. And then as I say, Soul Side, the other one, another one is Beef Eater and Grey Matter. We loved. I love Beef Eater. Yeah. House Burning Down. It's yeah, we 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 loved all that stuff. But anyway, all that to say, on the set, I don't know if I'm who's interrupting whose story, but in the '88 time, so I went to DC in '87 and '88, and in '88 we saw Fugazi, and then I came home and I was just like, uh, my my Dagnasty worshiping band is over, uh, like it's like Fugazi is blowing my mind. Like these guys are hardcore guys, but the, like the music they're playing, it's like we have to we have to change we have to open we have to open up our palette to more things and i mean so it was like fugazi and and the minutemen like were kind of my template from there like and so i was in a band with jay from 87 to 90 and i was like like no means no i mean jay was into rem but i was like trying to play no means no drums and i was the drummer in that band and right right playing no means no and george hurley george hurley He's and, a great drummer. Yeah, he's like he's the best. And and Brent Brendan Canty, like I I loved all that shit. Well, I like. Did you like the band Shudder to Think at all? Well, see, I met the Shudder to Think guys. So I went down the first year. I went down with two friends, and the second year I went down with my band, and we <laughs> we brought our instruments just in case some kind of tour broke out because you know anything can happen in punk rock or something. Sure, of course. So we were in a van with all our instruments and at, at the border, it's like, what do you have all these instruments for? It's like, we just like to play music, but we had no shows, you know, we just went down like honest, like naively thinking that, you know, someone's going to befriend us. And, but we did befriend Shudder to Think like in a parking lot and like, Weird. and, and, you know, they, you know, I bought their single was like the abysmal yellow popcorn wall or whatever that single was. Right. And, and, uh, I forget if that was 88 or 87, probably 88. But uh, I don't know if we saw them or not. And I and that guy Stuart from Shutter Think gave me their his phone number and address and all that kind of stuff. He was 
they were super nice to us. But I don't, I didn't, I didn't really follow them. And and I agree with Fugazi. I didn't really follow them. I I had the first two things. I thought they were so great, <laughs> and then Repeater. But then I kind of became. I got into like My Bloody Valentine and like shoegaze stuff and. Yeah. Um, so like I, I stopped. I stopped loving Fugazi. I didn't follow them. Any. The program. last, uh, the last and this band I was really into was Shutter to Think. They had a mm -hmm. record called Get Your Goat, and then they got off of Discord, went to Epic Records, and did their best record ever, Pony Express Record, which is a completely bizarre, anti, really non-commercial, weird, fucking ahead of its time record. And it was better than anything they did on as a listener to me, yeah. you know. Um, but but they were when they were on Discord records, they were the last Discord band I actively followed. And that was a long, long time ago. I give the Discord records was great. I'm, I'm sure they're still great, but um, yeah, I'm not really following that stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of dropped off after Repeater, I guess. Like I had it and I, I thought it was great, and and uh, I, you know, I think there was a like a, a perceived humorlessness of the whole thing. Like I think that brother, you just nailed it right there. Yeah, so like I think that, and, and Ian Mackay is my hero. Like, like there's that kind of no getting around it. Like he's my hero, but um, and I think that those guys were probably as funny as anybody else. But um, sure. But when it comes to in a band, the the balance between what I call character and cool, it's like it's great to be cool, but if you're too cool, it's like you're, you're John. John Cale or whatever, like if you if you're too goofy, then you're in the bare naked ladies, whatever it's like, but like um, I say the, the Beastie Boys to me are like just the ultimate example of the funniest, coolest people all in one kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of what I aspired to be or whatever, like it's, I, I really wanted to. Anyway, it was something that I thought that Fugazi was pretty far from like I didn't think that they were very fun. You know? I yeah, I think, um, and, and you know, like, I'm sure they're all really nice, decent people. I've met a few of yeah. them. And they're, they're, I'm sure they're great. You know, it's, it's 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 a comment on my idea of what I think they are, which I'm sure is not true. But um, there's nothing wrong with being serious about what you do. But, um, you know, I, I always had a kind of a bizarre sense of humor and, and never tried to be cool or whatever and which is probably another reason why i maybe attitude wise i was more into something like the melvins because mm -hmm. they certainly take their music seriously but they never really took themselves seriously and they used to have all these really great things that they would do to antagonize people that didn't like them that i still think to this day are really great mm -hmm. um you know, and also back then I was probably, you know, when you're a young adult, you're not super, you'll like or hate things for stupid reasons that you invent in your head. And I certainly have been guilty of that. You know, yeah. like, like it's, it, it's not just a band to like or dislike, it's a battlefield and some imaginary battle that nobody cares about that you're waging in your head. So I'm sure there's probably some of that in there too. <laughs> we, 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 we found ourselves in the same situation that I think Fugazi could never get away from, which is just like this, you know, uh, Ian Mackay is like punk or hardcore ground zero. And there's a certain expectation of the type of show that's going to be. And then they really tried to like shut that down. Like they was like, it's no longer a place to get fucking crazy or violent or it's like, let's make it a, a welcoming uh, environment for women. And you know what I mean? Like it's really kind of like yeah. softening a softening of the thing. Whereas, you know, I don't know if the Melvins is probably still a pretty dude heavy uh, hang, you know what I mean? I spent 10 years selling merchandise for them and I, I um, it got better as time went on. There were always more women there, but um, it is like a lot of other heavy rock music. It is a little bit more male based for whatever reason the way that stuff always is but know? i think but i think that fugazi and nirvana um i think they you know they, they probably had to 
uh, you know, it sucks when you're in a band and you have to kind of like, you have, you have to, you want to be exciting people, but like, then you spend all this time, like throwing a wet blanket over everything so that people aren't getting hurt. So like, uh, you know, the show started with a bunch of women or girls at the front of the stage like this. And then you see, <laughs> you, you know, over the course of the show, they're just gone. Cause it's just like fucking thugs. And, yeah, but that and that's that stuff was always there from day one of ever hearing about punk rock. There was always this element of stupid. Pe- yeah, there was a lot about punk rock that fucking sucked. 